This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark. Now, every week we bring you scientific results from the UH Manoa campus, and it's either in space science or it's in earth science. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our guest, who is a returning guest. Estelle Bonney is going to be telling us a little bit about both Earth science and space science today. So Estelle, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. Yep. Um, really excited to hear what you have to say today because I understand that primarily we're going to be talking about a new scientific paper which you've just had published. Yes. And this relates to? Uh, trying to predict the end of a lava flow forming eruption. And our backdrop, for example, shows a moving RR flow, which is these thick, hot lava flows which we have in Hawaii. And your satellite observations are trying to predict how, not that lava flow, but <laughs> other ones in general. So tell me a little bit about what the, the background is for your paper. All right, so it's basically the idea is that um, a lot of people actually care about when an eruption starts, right? Um, that's really important, and we do care about it. But for long-lasting lava flows, it also is important to know when it's going to end, uh, especially for some um, places where you have a city close by, and it can reach the city or not. Um, people might have to evacuate or not. Um, so knowing when an eruption would end is actually also of a pretty big importance for um, hazard management. So um, a hazard manager on the Big Island, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, might be particularly interested in certain eruptions actually on the Big Island. But in your satellite study, the, presumably, you can look anywhere around the world. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we use a certain satellite called MODIS, uh, which is a moderate resolution imaging spectrogeometer uh, that's on board uh, two different spacecraft. And it can go over over the years and can image the same place uh, four times a day. Four times a day. Uh, at what level of detail? Uh, the satellite I use has like a one square kilometer pixel. One so square. it's pretty, really large, uh, but it's still uh, usable and useful for the re repeats. So you, you cannot see a person in this Definitely image. Definitely not. <laughs> but volcanic eruptions presumably are... Uh, um, bright enough, or how do you detect the eruption? Uh, we use thermal remote sensing. Okay, so, so we're using the heat, thermal cameras. It, yeah, the heat of the lava flow is detected from space. Just to say these night vision goggles, which people can wear to see a person because of the temperature that they are emitting. Yeah, exactly. It's the same kind of principle. And do, yeah. do you make the observations during just the daytime? or? Uh, we, also, we also have nighttime. You also have night time, yeah. so which is better? At in night terms of time, because then you don't have any solar reflection and anything in there. So the sun reflecting off the surface exactly. of the, the line might uh, conspire to yeah, make it Yeah, you need more to different. take that into account. All right, let's take a look at the first slide. Even though we've got a nice backdrop here, let's take a look at our first slide. And I believe this is an eruption that. Kilauea, or this could be Mauna Loa, I'm not too sure which one, but this is the kind of thing which presumably would be detectable from your spacecraft. Yeah, so we uh, we look at lava flows. Um, this is a nice fissure, and you can see uh, those lava fountains that then uh, gets on the ground, and it creates those uh, black uh, lines that then flow downhill, uh, and that's what we are interested in. And it's not just the... Uh, the orange fire fountain, as it's called, uh, part of the eruption which you're observing. It's the black bit yeah. as well, which yeah. is also hot. This black bit is still really hot. Yeah. Um, so uh, compared to the surrounding, it's, um, it's the temperature difference is high enough to be detected from. Space. Any idea what sort of temperatures uh, the, these flows are? Uh, so the red part is between um, like up to 1,200 degrees Celsius. And okay. the black part, uh, the crust, uh, might be, uh, it definitely changes a lot, but uh, between 100 degree and 500 degree. And of Celsius. course, as we, we look to the left, 
what we're seeing are fully grown ohia trees. Yes. So this must be quite a big eruption. So it's identifiable from space. Yeah, for sure. All right. And so far over the last few decades, we've only had eruptions of Kilauea. But of course, we also worry and HVO worries a little bit about uh, Mauna Loa yes. activity. Yeah. And so your models might actually be applicable for that scale of eruption. Yeah. Uh, the Pu'u'u eruption is actually not really working for the model because it's been going on for the past 34 years. Okay. Uh, but Mauna Loa is an episodic uh, style of eruption. So uh, you have an eruption. The last one was in 1984, and it lasted uh, about 20 days. Um, and that's exactly the case of what we could use the model for. So, right. And um, our second slide, I think, actually shows uh, the flow paths from the uh, the March 84 Mauna Loa eruption. Mm -hmm. Mauna Loa is down uh, on the bottom left, yeah. A, correct? Yeah. yeah. And then all those colors, the orange and the red, they're individual That's lava flows, good. which mm -hmm seemed almost to get to the outskirts of downtown yeah, here. So it stopped almost, uh, I think, about four miles away. So how would your model actually work then? You, you, you're making observations of these short-lived eruptions. Um, do you need to get there quickly, or what, what's the, the challenge in using satellites? So um, the challenge is to get near real-time data. So um, Explain what that is. So Basically, as the eruption is going on, we will get the da data right away with no lag time between when the, the acquisition is made and the time where we actually can use it. Uh, so right now, the data that I use is about 12 to 18 hours behind. Um, so there's quite a large gap, if, especially if it's, let's say, a couple day long eruption. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a challenge. Uh, but as we get those data, we can get it almost every six hours, um, which is way better than uh, going on the field every six hours. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Particularly in hazardous conditions, presumably. Yeah, and it's, yes. if the measurement that we make is actually pretty hard to get on the field, uh, there's a lot of assumption, and um, being in a lot of places is hard, but from space you have this really wide view so you can see the whole thing at once. So typically you can get hold of the data of a new eruption within 12 hour, twelve to 18 hours. Mm -hmm. Is that after the satellite has made the observation? You say it comes by every yeah. six hours. Yeah. Well, so um, I, about every six hours, because we have two satellites and they, they come at different times. Mm -hmm. um, and they do one, per, one image per day and one image per night. So you have like four per day. Um, so it's not every six hours exactly, and, and you get the data when um, they ha are above the ground station, they can send the data back to Earth, or right. to the ground. <laughs> and, and I understand in your paper, you were doing what are called retrospective studies, yes. correct? You're, you're not working with a disaster manager, at least not yet. Not yet, no. no. So yet. what we've done so far is actually just looking at the database from MODIS that we've had since 2000, uh, trying to see all the eruptions that have been detected since then, uh, all the lab flow eruptions, and then um, try to retrocast and use our uh, certain uh, method to try to see if we could predict uh, the end of the and, and retrocasting would mean that you're looking back in time. Yeah, we already so, know when it ended. Yeah. We already know when it started, but uh, we pretend that we don't and just use the data um, as if it was coming um, in real time. I understand. And how many eruptions have you been able to study in this way? Uh, about a hundred eruptions. A hundred? Yeah. On uh, uh, um, many different volcanoes then? Uh, hundred, about 104 at 34 different volcanoes. 34 different volcanoes. So that many eruptions since the satellites were operating in 2000. So yes, and those are so about, two, two, about, two, about two a year. Yeah. 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 Something like that. Yeah. Well, let's see. We're, I think we've got another slide of another eruption. Um, and 
this is the one which you've actually worked on. All right, yeah. explain to the viewers what it is we're seeing in this black and white image. Yeah, so right now you're actually seeing Iceland. Um, you can see in the larger image the shape of the island. And there's a zoom in on this, uh, those bright pixel right there okay. in the but middle of uh, Iceland. And this is from the uh, 2014 to 2015 uh, Holofron eruption in Iceland. And you see those really bright pixels, so the square pixels that are really bright, those are um, really hot, and that's where the lava flow is. I see. All right. And then I think in the next slide, we'll actually see how you start interpreting some of these data. So here we've got a curve. Yes. So and again, tell us what the curve is showing. So this is um, this, the black line. This um, is a stereotypical line called the Wadge curve. So this is based on the 1981 paper that he published. Jeff Wadge. Jeff Wadge. Okay. Uh -huh. A UK volcanologist uh, where he def define this uh, asymmetric uh, behavior of the effusion rates over time. And the effusion rates is the instantaneous measurement of uh, volume flux of lava that comes out of the ground. So uh, we're basically showing a diagram. Time goes from the beginning on the left-hand side yes. to the right-hand side, yes. and effusion rate is in units of cubic meters. Units so the spike on the left hand side. Yeah, so you can see in basically he defined that uh, most episodic basaltic ev uh, fugitive eruptions would behave like this with a really sharp increase at the beginning of an eruption um, and then a slow decrease over time due to the elastic release of energy um, that and this is the part that takes the longest um, to do and that's the part that we care about in Predictive All right, and of course, in real life, time might be measured in days, yes. in weeks, yes, and <laughs> at, at months. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And, and the effusion rate. Any idea uh, what scale of eruption? Um, you know, you say Kilauea isn't a very good volcano to model, but Mauna Loa back in '84 was hundreds of cubic meters a yeah, second. Yeah. yeah, that's the sort of thing which yeah. you, you're, you're studying here. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think the next diagram will actually show us in a bit more quantitative manner. Yeah. All right, this looks really complicated. So yes. <laughs> help the viewers and myself understand what right. it is we're looking at here. So but. again, it's effusion rates on the y-axis against uh, time or the eruption duration in days in this case. Um, you have all the black uh, crosses are basically synthetic data points. So I made this graph to and to try to understand how we used our metal to, model to predict the end of the eruption. Is this from a specific eruption? Or? No, this is just the general idea. Okay. So uh, the idea is that at day, day, um, time zero, the, the eruption starts, you get a first data point that's pretty low uh, in efficient rates. And then you get a couple more data points, but you cannot do anything until your rate reach the maximum um, efficient rate. That's Q max yes, that's on Q the left-hand side, the red, the red cross. The red something. cross, yes. Okay. So there are three red cross that are important, the start, <laughs> the, the maximum, and the end. Uh -huh. um, then you have you need to have a couple more points as the eruption goes on. And you have different colors. So you have orange, green, blue, purple, and red. Um, that tells you how much data point we used. So um, at first, you only have a few data points. Then with that, you can start fitting an exponential curve. And then as the eruption goes on, you have more data points. So you fit a new exponential curve, et cetera, et cetera, until uh, reach the end of the eruption, and then we try to estimate this delta T of the difference between the predicted time and the observed time, okay. and see how it changes. Okay, uh, and nobody had thought about doing this before, or the data weren't available? Or? Um, yeah, it's a mix of both. Mix of both? Yeah, because um, the data set that I used is only since 2000. And in the past, they've measured effusion rates, but at really sparse um, 
resolution. Okay. So go there a day, and then you go there 10 days later. So you don't have a lot of um, resolution temple. You don't have a lot of data points to do it. So this presumably is why you published the paper, right? Yes. <laughs> well, well, we're getting close to the first half of the show, Estelle. Okay. But I want to pick up on that point when we come back, because if nobody else had done this before, that explains why it's been such a popular paper, yeah. all right? <laughs> so you. let me just remind the viewers that you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guest today is Estelle Bunny, who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. And we'll be back in about a minute. See you then. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Greetings, I'm Martin Despang, the longtime host of Human Humane Architecture here on Think Tech Hawaii. Think Tech is important to our community because think about how awesome our uh, natural environment he is here in Hawaii, and we need to make our built environment equally awesome, uh, exotically and inclusively. So because of that, for the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, thanksforthinktech.causevox.com. On behalf of the ThinkTech community, enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii, 30-plus weekly shows, thank you so much for your generosity. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today is Estelle Burney, who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. Now, Estelle, in the first half of the show, you described this model mm -hmm. which you've written up and it's been published. And as our next slide is going to show, you got quite a bit of publicity <laughs> from this. So if we can yeah. briefly go across... And uh, maybe it's a little small print for the viewers to read, but on the left-hand side, I put together, this is the, the cover of your, yes. your paper, yes. and it was published in a journal called Bulletin of Volcanology. And then on the right-hand side, just a glimpse of what the media attention is. Yes. Now, for our viewers, I should explain that Estelle is a graduate student. She's working on a PhD. Mm -hmm. And this paper, which you published earlier this summer, got quite a lot of attention, right? Yes. Um, it was actually my first paper. Your first ever paper. <laughs> first ever paper. Um, and um, we have this um, open, uh, this person at school that um, uh, make press release on what's going on at SOAS. And, um, SOAS is the School of Ocean, Earth, Science and Technology. Yes. Sorry. Yes. And so she uh, put together a small um, text about my paper, and this got a lot of attention. And I got calls from HPR, the radio, um, from AOS and Science Magazine. Um, so it was kind of surprising um, and, and exciting. And it really, <laughs> yeah, it must be fabulous. I mean, sort of your first paper and lots of people are paying attention. What kinds of things did they want to know? Um, they really just asked basic question and um, everything I told them was what I wrote in the paper. There wasn't much things new, um, uh -huh. but I just, I don't know. It, it was just like telling them how we got the IT, why is it so new? Uh, how this relevant to Hawaii and things like a that. Any interest from disaster managers? Because presumably your methodology could be quite useful to people on the ground. Right. Um, so far, not really. I do have a contact at HBO that is interested uh, to use that model in case Mauna Loa uh, wakes up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that's about it. Oh, really? So are you expecting 
with all your future papers that you're publishing, will you get this kind of <laughs> media not. attention? <laughs> not all of them. It must, be, them. it must be fascinating as a new graduate student to actually see that your research has got such broad interest and also some, some of the relevance. Yeah, I, I had friends on social media posting things for me. And I was like, hey, I found your name. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, even across the ocean uh, in Europe, people told me that they've seen my paper. You know, so that's really nice. <laughs> All right. So you may not have included it in your actual paper, but what are the limitations of, of your technique? Mm -hmm. you, you say that you've tried to apply this methodology to over 100 different eruptions. Yeah. How often did it work? Do you know why it did work or not work? All right, so the first thing I need to specify is that um, out of those 100, 100 eruptions, first we looked at the shape of this uh, effusion rate. Does it actually look like it's doing this behavior all the time? And it's not. <laughs> so nature is um, complicated. And so it's actually we only found that shape or that behavior 30% of the time. Okay. Uh, so that's definitely a limitation, and uh, we would not be able to tell the, the different shape before, like, a lot of, quite a lot of the eruption had um, happened. So uh, you need to collect data, perhaps, for a week before you can tell the general characteristics of the eruption? So, uh, but the, the part of it is that even if the shape is different, um, I could eventually um, update uh, the model or the prediction as the, uh, the eruption goes on. So we have different shapes that uh, we identified. So it's either um, completely random, but sometimes you do have a couple peaks. So instead of having just one, you have a second one. Mm. And we could update that as mm -hmm. time goes on. Or sometimes it just has different shape um, um, that we could also um, try to mod like model differently. Right. So, um, that's one limitation. And, and, and presumably, it's critical to get measurements right at the peak. Yeah, exactly. Right. I actually, How easy or difficult is that? It's uh, difficult it's because difficult. Um, you can miss the peak. Uh, satellite measurements are great, but they are um, affected by clouds. So oh, if there's a cloud, volcano is not <laughs> if there's a cloud on top of it, it might um, make the measurement but have a, a lower uh, efficient rate than it actually is and miss the peak. So, um, that I and if, and if you miss the peak, presumably this curve that you were talking about would start off at a lower level yeah. and so you'd would think it would uh, earlier. end earlier than yeah. in fact it would do. Mm -hmm. It's quite useful. I mean, we, we worry a little bit about Mauna Loa when that might erupt again. But presumably, that would be a very useful kind of eruption for us to be yes. modeling. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Very good. <laughs> so where do you take this model next? What, what, what do you do to help refine it? Or do, are you going to have more discussions with disaster managers so that it's actually of societal importance? Yeah. What, 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 what are your plans? Um, well, it's, it still need work, um, always. Um, and the, the main thing that we want to do is actually, instead of re retrocasting it, is actually using it for a real eruption. Um, but so far, um, I haven't had the chance to look at uh, one as it goes. So I need to be like on top of it and make sure that I start as the eruption starts um, to try to predict and make my prediction and see if that works. That's one thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And but the second thing is um, we haven't talked about like management, disaster management people, and I think it's still something that uh, we need to take in. Like it's a good thing, but it doesn't have to be like okay, the Stellus is gonna stop then, so now you're good. But it's still like maybe that's the sort of thing your advisor might get yeah. in to help with. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. In interesting, yes. So, um, if Mauna Loa was, was to erupt, you have to get ready to work with the data 
from day one. Yeah. And we have no understanding Monolo in the past. Uh, in the 19th century erupted for 200 days, whereas the 84 eruption only lasted 23 days. Mm -hmm. How quickly can you actually get some kind of information to even the scientific community, if not the disaster managers? That this right. is well, I think um, really, really quickly, uh, because this um, short, this increase part is actually pretty fast. Uh, so it depends, but it can be from a couple hours to a few days. Um, then after that, after this maximum is reached, that's when you can start uh, feeding curves to the data. Mm -hmm. And so it might not be very good accuracy, but still can get us an idea. Would it help if you had either a greater level of detail, the spatial resolution was improved, or the frequency at which... Mm, but definitely better temporal resolution. Temporal resolution, yeah. so more, more opportunities to image per day. Yeah, okay. and like maybe using more than just one satellite, or using all the satellites, and then importantly having the data in can, real can time. Can you augment your satellite observations with aircraft or with drones? Would that be possible? Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, it could be something uh, different uh, data processing, but you can definitely calculate the same thing. So as long as the entire eruption is within the same field of view, yeah. you can't go over one place and one occasion yeah. and then elsewhere? Um, it, it would be all your yeah, data set uh, that we can and, include. And are you working on these ideas for your your um, PhD thesis, or is this, uh, is this really. it? You've had enough publicity <laughs> from this particular study. Yeah, right now, I <laughs> feel like um, I want to do other stuff, and then maybe I'll try to um, okay. include uh, more. But it, it, it's great to see that you know, this first investigation that you published got such wide publicity and that people see the significance of your work, and hopefully you or your advisor can actually start talking to not only Hawaii Volcano Observatory, but maybe elsewhere around the world. So congratulations on Thank the work. Thank you so much. <laughs> work. Well, unfortunately, Estelle, we've got to the end of the show. But thank you again for being on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, maybe we can get you back at a later date. But let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today has been Estelle Bunny who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. And I hope that you will join us again next week for another show starting 1 o'clock on Monday. So see you then. Goodbye.